Hi, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Stephen Phillips. Uh, Stephen is a well-published Yale trained uh, physician, researcher, and author, specializing in vector-borne uh, infections. He has treated more than 20,000 uh, of the most complex patients uh, from 20 countries. He authored uh, the best-selling book, Chronic, which is uh, totally researched and highly referenced um, deep dive into the uh, causal relationship um, of chronic infection to chronic and autoimmune uh, illnesses. Today, he's going to talk with us about uh, chronic Lyme and uh, long COVID shared perspective. Um, Dr. Felix, the uh, platform is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Madach, and thank you to MIT for inviting me to speak. It's a, it's a privilege and a pleasure. Yes, I'll be speaking about chronic Lyme, long COVID, and their shared perspectives i.e. overlaps. And before we start, I like these two quotes so much that I couldn't decide between them, so I decided to include them both. But the top pretty much represents how I felt when I start, first started diving into these things and going down these rabbit holes. And then the second is just advice to anybody that you kind of have to doubt the narrative because innovation is always a deviation from the norm. And they have this expression that radicalism plus time equals orthodoxy. And it's not too far off the mark. And innovation without change does not, does not exist. So the first thing I tell people is that we should be humbled before the enormity of science. And many doctors think they have things figured out and it's really far from the truth. Um, there's data that the earth houses about 1 trillion microbial species and we have proven by relatively accurate mathematical equations that 99.99% of the microbes on earth are yet to be discovered. And to make it even more humbling, more than 99% of the microbes that we carry in our own microbiomes are unknown to science. And you say, how do they figure out that these microbes are unknown if we haven't discovered them yet? They look at the genetic diversity among the microbes that we now have, and they can extrapolate out accurately to find out how many there should be. So we'll start with going over the Lyme. The basics is caused by Borrelia burgdorferi, which is a spirochete. This is a cousin to the bacteria that causes syphilis, and it can invade any part of the body. And because it can get in any part of the body, they call it the great imitator, because it can present with cardiac and neurologic and rheumatologic and psychiatric and a whole host of symptomology. And you get this huge spectrum from completely healthy to really severe illness and even fatal disease. And the symptoms typically come and go. But it's more and more thought of as collectively because there are many species and strains of the organism that causes Lyme. Borrelia burgdorferi is the classic, but for example, Borrelia miyamotoi in the Northeast is very common, about 40% as common as Lyme. And then in the South, we have Borrelia lonestari, and Becerai, and in kind of in the Midwest, we have Mayonai, named after Mayo Clinic. And they have Borrelia species around the world and many, many hundreds of substrains. And they keep discovering new species almost daily. And then they're overlapping spectrums of illness with other bacteria that set up chronic infection like Bartonella and Brucella, and Coxiella, Babesia. And then the other ones have less potential for chronic illness such as Anaplasma, Lickia, Rickettsia, and then there are many others and the big issue and why people fight about these illnesses and why these are some of the controversial topics in medicine is that these are fastidious organisms. It's meaning that you can't isolate them easily. You can't grow them like on a throat culture. They don't grow like strep will grow. And for example, the bacteria that causes syphilis has been so difficult to grow. They've only made advancements in the last few years after a hundred years of trying. And Lyme isn't as hard to grow is syphilis, but it's almost as hard. And because of that, for example, if you inject a dog with Lyme bacteria, Bibidorferi, and then let the dog get sick, and then take the blood from the dog, you can't isolate the bacteria from the dog. And it's the same with people. So the times they've done it have been few and far between. So Lyme, like I said, has this large spectrum. It can be rapidly fatal, even in young, healthy people, as demonstrated here with Lyme carditis and fatal disease related to neurologic damage and fatal disease related to lung damage. 
I want to highlight to the last reference where it says, because it's a direct quote from the study, despite appropriate antimicrobial therapy, rapidly fatal lung disease continued. So I would question what is appropriate antimicrobial therapy when the patient rapidly dies of the illness. And Bartonella can also, like Lyme, cause this entire spectrum of asymptomatic infection to fatal disease. And fatal Bartonella carditis has been published in many age groups. Um, even young adults who were, there's a study of young adults who were like top level athletes. And I think there was over 10 of them that died of Bartonella carditis. And it affects all age groups. Once people get endocarditis from Bartonella, the mortality is 12%. And it can be very hard to culture, just like Lyme. The third is a case of Bartonella endocarditis when the patient died and the antibody was negative. The PCR, which is DNA test, was negative, And the culture was negative. And you say, how did you diagnose this person if everything was negative? After death, they found um, a nested PCR which is a type of PCR that's ultra sensitive and is not available at routine laboratories. And that was the only test that was positive. And then I have a couple of cases here of young boys who were previously healthy who died of fatal infection of the brain with Bartonella. And then more in the middle of the spectrum, Bartonella and Lyme both can cause chronic life-threatening disease. And the reason that I'm talking about Bartonella and Lyme, even though the focus of this talk is chronic Lyme and long COVID, is that many Lyme patients that are considered chronic Lyme patients are really Bartonella patients. They're easily confused. The symptoms overlap like 90%. It's very hard to clinically distinguish and the testing is quite poor. So here you have a situation where people who are awaiting heart transplant, when they did serologies, meaning antibody tests for Bartonella, they found that there was a big difference in the patients who are seropositive, meaning positive antibody tests versus the healthy controls who had negative antibody tests with a p-value, as you see, p002, p three zeros and two. And then they looked at a case of 110 dilated cardiomyopathy patients. So this is a type of heart failure where the heart enlarges and many of these patients go on to develop progressive heart failure requiring you know, transplant and then went and did heart muscle biopsies in all these patients, and they found Lyme DNA in 20%. And in those patients, they treated them and the heart failure resolved. And in the study, they made a case, you know, they made a point to say that 64% of these people were seronegative. They had antibody tests that were negative, and only one had AV block, which is atrioventricular block. And that is a stereotypical kind of cardiac presentation that people hear about. But like many stereotypes, it's not only wrong, it's actually harmful because it leads people in the wrong direction. And they also made a point to say that none of these people get typical other Lyme symptoms. They didn't have Bell's palsy. They didn't have arthritis. They weren't multi-system presentations. They were just heart failure. So interesting tidbit. My dad happened to develop cardiomyopathy in the mid-90s. And his situation was that he had what they thought was a viral meningitis in the 70s. And shortly after that, developed benign heart palpitations that were for many years just benign. The doctors couldn't figure it out. After about 10 years, he went into atrial fibrillation, a more specific type of, but generally not so serious arrhythmia. And after that, slowly insidiously developed heart failure. And we took him to the best cardiologists, the top doctors at the teaching hospitals all throughout New York City. And despite maximal medical therapy, had progressive heart failure. And I was finishing up my Lyme research, you know, kind of programs when I was in residency at Yale. And I obviously learned that Lyme can cause dilated cardiomyopathy. So I said to his very elite doctor, can we tap him for Lyme? And the doctor refused and said, he didn't have Bell's palsy or arthritis. And that's ridiculous. And he said, you're a doctor. Now you do it. And I did it. And it was negative. His Lyme test was negative. And without heart transplant, he was facing approximately six months survival. And I had already been on doxycycline for three years when I was a kid for acne. And it's a relatively innocuous drug and they give it for zits all the time. And I had to just make a risk benefit decision. Should I give him an empiric trial of doxycycline or let him go on for heart transplant? And I chose to give him an empiric trial of doxycycline. He started responding. And to make long story short, his heart failure resolved completely with longer term antibiotics and he actually died two months ago, not from heart failure. 
and he was almost 89 years old. And these are cases that can be reversed. I've had the pleasure in my practice to treat about 60 patients with dilated cardiomyopathy with end stage, and we've gotten all of them better, 100%. So I use the word sir negative in the case series of patients with dilated cardiomyopathy because the majority were negative by Lyme antibody. And what do you do if this is a test you rely on? If you don't know what these illnesses can cause, you're going to miss a lot of cases. And how do you know when those cases really have the illness if they're seronegative? Well, in some studies, they took patients who had positive PCRs, which are DNA tests, or positive PCRs and or culture, and did a comparison. And in this study of patients with positive PCRs, 32 of them, they found that the majority, 56%, were seronegative. And in a study of 41 patients, that were either culture positive or PCR positive, even though most of the symptoms for over a year, almost two thirds of sir negative. And this goes against conventional wisdom. Conventional wisdom is that the Lyme tests are accurate. You know, this is, like I said, a highly controversial topic. There are divergent views from various medical societies. And one in particular infectious disease side of America is of the opinion that the Lyme tests are very accurate, but there's a lot of data saying that's not true. And it's actually, um, there's been meta-analysis on the topic showing that they're roughly 50% sensitive. And then we have recent documentation of what doctors who've been in this field for a while have known is that seronegative patients can convert to seropositive once they're treated with antibiotics. So the antibiotics, I mean, the, the antibodies bind to the bacteria. And ironically, when you kill some of the bacteria, you can free up some antibody to get picked up on the test because the test only picks up free antibody and they call it blossoming out of the test. So let's look at chronic illness outcomes with the earliest phase of Lyme to treat. So erythema migrans is a Lyme rash. And after a standard course of a few weeks to a month of antibiotics, Johns Hopkins looked at patients and found that 39% had persistent symptoms and or functional impacts six months later. Danbury Hospital, which is a hospital just up the road from my office, looked at 61 patients and they found that 61% reported symptoms persisting at six to nine, six to 12 months. And they made a point in the study to say that the symptoms that persisted overlapped almost entirely with their initial Lyme presentation. And what do you call this? A lot of doctors will call this post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. It happens to be the exact same symptoms as Lyme disease. And other doctors will say, this doesn't make any sense to make up a post-infectious syndrome that just happens to have the exact same symptoms as the initial illness. And then what happens in untreated late stage Lyme, which is generally harder than early Lyme? Here's a study where they found patients who had well-documented early Lyme, uh, either by erythema migraines and or symptoms with positive serologies, and they weren't treated for six months. And they gave them four weeks of doxy or combined it to four weeks of doxy versus two weeks of ceftriaxone, which is an IV antibiotic. When they follow them up, not only did a, an uncomfortably high rate of patients not improve at all, 26% on the doxy group and 30% in the doxy plus ceftriaxone group, there were no cures. Everybody remained different. They still, they developed chronic symptoms and they may not have been disabling symptoms, but they weren't back to how they were before Lyme. It changed them kind of irrevocably. So after fighting about what is the best treatment, do the treatments work? How are the antibody tests? 35 years of arguing, and they have found in the last five or six years that the recommended treatments for Lyme the ones that are deemed curative by IDSA, amoxicillin, cefuroxime, doxycycline, and ceftriaxone, none of them effectively kill Lyme bacteria in the test tube. And the combinations of them are not more effective. So we ask ourselves, if they don't kill it in vitro, how can we expect for them to work in vivo? And then the next question is, how could they possibly miss this? How could they possibly not know that it didn't work in, v in, in the test tube? It's because they, they change form. You know, these organisms have variegated forms. There's a lot of pleomorphism. Uh, now they call them persister forms, which I think is kind of a dumb name, but it's what they call them. And um, 
it just represents a whole range of forms that persist. And these antibiotics will kill, let's say 90% and some percentage survive and they take the antibiotics away and they grow back. And I just wanna you know, give you a sense of how common these illnesses are. By CDC estimates, 476,000 new cases of Lyme occur per year. This is a global phenomenon. I used to take patients from around the world and now I don't because it's logistically difficult. But I've seen patients from more than 20 countries and I've done two European speaking tours on this topic. And you know, it's a huge problem all over. And uh, it's more uh, prevalent than breast cancer, colon cancer, HIV, hepatitis C, all of those combined. And yet there's only three NIH funded randomized controlled trials looking at antibiotics versus placebo. And that's been over the past 20 years. And the problem is that they're using the same kind of, I would call them ineffective antibiotic regimens that are shown to fail and that now shown to fail in the test tube. They've used uh, doxycycline and ceftriaxone. So two of, the, two of those three studies demonstrated benefits across many domains. And some of those benefits were sustained and some of them were unsustained. One of those studies that didn't show benefits had massive statistical design flaws. I was actually an author on one of the, on a paper that gave a biostatistical analysis of that study. And for people in the treated group to have noticed, a, for them to have noticed the benefit to treatment, they would have had to improve to a level of health that was a full standard deviation superior than the general health in the population of the United States. So it is a reasonable expectation for antibiotics to bring people closer to normal when they're sick with Lyme. It's not a reasonable expectation to have them be a full standard deviation better than average uh, when they get treated. So there is a, a tremendous amount of data demonstrating chronic Lyme at this point, apart from the data showing that we can't kill it in the test tube, apart from the NIH study where they put uh, uninfected ticks on patients with quote, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome and a subset of those ticks got infected with Lyme bacteria from those post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome patients apart from the robust animal studies where they've looked at mice and dogs and monkeys, our closest human model, and show that the antibiotics that are purported to cure humans do not cure these animals. Aside from all that, just because of limitations of time, I could make 60 slides just on that. And the human data, I'm just gonna present a few, but to tell you about the human data, you know, the big difference between the animals and the humans is that they don't cut the, anim they don't cut the humans up so much. So a lot of it's surgical data. This first study is the only study of um, an innovative blood culture technique, but I'll just start with this. So the, the authors, direct quote, say that this study would not have happened if all the samples had been evaluated by the authors according to CDC guidelines. Why is that? Because of the patients that were culture positive, they had negative antibody tests for Lyme. They were not from Lyme endemic areas and had previously received long-term antibiotics. And yet Bibidorferi and Borrelia bicetii was isolated alive from blood despite up to nine months of doxycycline. And in this study of 165 well-documented Lyme patients, meaning that they met the very strict CDC criteria for Lyme, they had an average of 16 weeks of antibiotics. Despite that, 19% of the patients relapsed and of those relapsers, 41% were positive by culture and or PCR. They retreated all of them, not just the culture and PCR positives, all the relapsers and over two thirds of them improved again with antibiotics. And here we have a case of a 24 year old who had a Lyme rash followed by Lyme arthritis and then the antibiotic uh, treatment was helpful, the arthritis resolved, and then it kept coming back. And she was treated in total for, I think, over two years when you combine the oral and IV antibiotics. And then they finally did joint surgery on her because arthritis is so bad. And the joint tissue and fluid that demonstrated copious spirochetes and the joint fluid was Lyme PCR positive. And here we have a case where, this is an unfortunate case. There was a 39 year old person previously healthy who was diagnosed with Lyme and she was treated with three weeks of IV and four months of oral antibiotics and still wasn't doing as well as she should have, was relapsing. And then they sent her culture out to CDC actually. And the spinal fluid was culture positive for Bibidorferi. 
And then her doctor treated her with over a year of aggressive antibiotics, IVs, orals. And then insurance said, you know, there's really no such thing as chronic Lyme. And denied coverage, the treatment was stopped, and the patient died when the treatment was stopped. Then afterwards, the team went in and did exams of her tissues and found in her heart, kidneys, liver, brain, uh, bubidophori is confirmed by fluorescent insight to hybridization and PCR with sequencing, both of which are extremely specific techniques. So here we'll just uh, switch to COVID because if I went on to you know, present all the human data, I would say there's about roughly 30 studies out there documenting human persistent infection by isolation of live bubidophori after antibiotics that are supposed to be curative meaning four weeks plus. And the studies I just presented were in the years of antibiotics, but there are many studies with six months of antibiotics, four months of antibiotics, that type of thing. So for COVID, we know that at three to six months uh, after, um, let's say, recovery, um, oops, sorry, I'm just screwing up the slides here. I'm just trying to get, because the um, for Zoom, the top is, uh, uh, is obscuring my slides. But anyway, so long COVID, PASC, which is post-acute sequela of COVID and post-COVID are the terminology they give to people who have um, you know, persistent symptoms. We know that it's common. So three to six months, about two thirds of people had persistent symptoms. The folks that were hospitalized with more severe you know, cases of COVID were higher risk for developing long COVID. But even 23% of patients with mild acute illness still develop long COVID. And it's six to nine months between 26 and 30%, depending on which study you look at, we're still affected. And uncommonly, I mean, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, all age groups were affected. It didn't just uh, localize to the older groups uh, that much. And a lot of times they're looking at these uh, long COVID cases and they're describing them as autoimmune, post-viral and post-infectious. And I have concerns about that because once people start to use that terminology, it kind of stops the investigation. There's, a, there's an assumption when you say something is post-viral, post-infectious or autoimmune. Um, chronic Lyme is described as post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. And despite, like I said, all the evidence we just talked about that demonstrates the persistence of chronic Lyme, that terminology has been so harmful that there is a tremendous patient population that's suffering from uh, chronic and sometimes disabling illness because patients don't take it seriously. I mean, doctors don't take it seriously and they're not looking for treatments that work better against the causative organism, despite the fact that there's been enough evidence to show that the causative organism still persists. And um, there's actually evidence that the type of causative organism, because the bacteria change when they're in the body. Johns Hopkins, this is not an included slide, but Johns Hopkins did a study to look at these altered forms, these persistent forms. They actually cause more severe disease in rodent models than the spirochetal form, than the spiral form. So, you know, doctors make a lot of statements that are true and sometimes they make a lot of statements that are, are not true. And one statement that's not true, which just was pulled out of a hat, was that these altered forms don't cause illness and they're not severe and they're not material in any way. And meanwhile, like so we have good animal data showing that these altered forms are actually more disease causing than the spiral forms. So I do believe that wording guides research and patient care. I just wanted to put that out there. And for example, they have something called post Ebola syndrome. It's really common about 90% of people who survive Ebola get post Ebola. And the question is, is it really post anything? So Ebola viral RNA has been found in semen, breast milk, saliva, and urine up to 40 months after the acute illness. It's most commonly found in semen. And the authors of this study recommended systematic prevention measures in male survivors are required. In terms of evaluating the infectivity of people with whatever you want to call this post, I don't like the term post anything, like I said, but people still have Ebola RNA in their semen topic for another talk. Um, but these stereotypes exist for pretty much everything in our society and they're usually harmful and virus stereotypes are as well. So they're usually thought of as either cleared from the body quickly, like influenza or hepatitis A or persistent 
uh, with chronic infection like HIV or herpes, but there are shades of gray. And the first study that I read that got me really thinking about this was a report of 12 men who were isolated at an Antarctic base that hadn't seen anyone 17 weeks. And despite their complete isolation, one by one, six out of 12 of them sequentially developed the common cold. So we don't even understand how the common cold virus works. And to make assumptions about these other viruses is just silliness. So what we do know about other coronaviruses is that they can persist within cells. That's been documented way before COVID came on the scene. It's also been documented that we can find other coronaviruses chronically in the brains of people and in their spinal cord on autopsy of MS patients. And it didn't technically correlate with the MS lesions. So I'm not saying making an opinion on whether it was causal or contributory for their MS, but it was in their brains and spinal cord. And then there's a study of influenza A where they found infectious virus in the tonsils from children with no with enlarged tonsils, but no respiratory infection. So they were carrying influenza, which is not something we think we typically think about. So then we look at recovered COVID patients. So 90 days after recovery, over 5% was still PCR positive by nasopharyngeal swabs. And in the PCR positive group, they had specific T cell responses, which suggest an active virus was still present. But they weren't contagious. They did contact tracing among these persistently PCR patients. And there were no new COVID cases among those contacts, over 750 of them. So what is it about persistent PCR positivity and lack of contagion? I don't think doctors have figured out how this works. But in this other study, 120 days after recovery, it just it goes to show you that we can't really rely on these nasopharyngeal swabs. So they were all negative in this group, but 50% had positive PCR by GI biopsies. And I don't know about you, but I'm not going to be interested in getting a colonoscopy to look for a COVID test. So, and then what, are you about, what about people with relapsing or long COVID? What happens with them? Uh, there's documentation up to 196 days after acute COVID. Then people who are immunocompetent, where they found persistent viral, viral RNA and antigens in the olfactory mucosa, olfactory bulb, in patients with persistent loss of smell. And then in this other study, two months after COVID recovery, after two negative nasopharyngeal swabs, the patient had recurrent severe COVID upon starting immunosuppressants. This implies that not only does the virus persist, it can come back with periods of immunosuppression. Then we have this last case, a tragic case of a man who was immunosuppressed before he had COVID, ended up having at least three documented relapses, something like six rehospitalizations and died after a grueling 154 days of relapsing illness from COVID and died from COVID basically. So we talk about ivermectin. This is a drug you may or may not have heard about, but just to give you a background, um, ivermectin is an antiparasitic that's been used for uh, many, many years. It has a very uh, good safety profile. It's inexpensive and billions of doses have been uh, dispensed around the world. The people who discovered ivermectin won the Nobel Prize, I think it was 2015, and then won it based on its antiparasitic activity. But it's got a broad range of activity, including uh, antiviral activity, it has really powerful anti-cancer properties and nobody talks about without toxicity against normal cells. And on top of everything else, it's an immune modulator, which means that it normalizes a, an, an immune response. Um, it's not an immune suppressant. It's a very different uh, kind of a situation. Ivermectin will reduce abnormal inflammation and actually improve abnormal immune suppression. So there's data that ivermectin can reduce mortality and improve virologic clearance in COVID patients. And a recent meta-analysis of 15 randomized controlled trials, randomized controlled trials using ivermectin demonstrate an overall 68% reduction in mortality and an 84% reduction in infection rates when used prophylactically. And the follow, the last one here is the only preprint unpublished you know, data that I'll present today. And it's a case series of 33 patients with long COVID. 
and 88% experienced uh, complete symptom resolution after two daily doses of ivermectin. So you say, what does this mean? Does this mean that the virus is still present and the ivermectin is working against the virus? I'm not sure. I don't claim to have answers for everything. And again, because ivermectin has divergent, you know, and diverse, I should say, activities in the body, I don't know that it's strictly working in antiviral. Quick question, Dr. Phillips. And now, hasn't ivermectin been uh, heavily discussed in the political sphere? Yeah, can we, uh, ivermectin is heavily, everything that's uh, inexpensive and uh, potentially helpful has been heavily discussed in the political sphere. So why don't we uh, hold questions at the end? I'm almost okay. done. Okay. So um, you look at symptom overlap between these conditions, chronic Lyme, long COVID, and ME-CFS have identical symptoms. And is this a coincidence or is this just how the body reacts when there's immunologic you know, perturbations over time, like long-term, low-level immune stimulation? Or is it something other than coincidence? Um, MECFS is likely multifactorial and has various microbial and viral infections. And I have seen this for years and years and years. Keep in mind, I've been in practice since 1996. I've had um, many patients uh, come to see me with a history of developing MECFS type presentations after getting a bad viral infection or bad infection of any kind. I've seen it after bad bacterial infections as well and I've seen after influenza, and mono, and dengue fever. And the association between MECFS with so many infections has been well documented, including Lyme and, and Coxiella. And how does it work? Are some of these infections staying in the body or are they flaring up infections that can be asymptomatic in the body previously? So like I said before, the spectrum of these infections like Lyme and, Bella, Lyme and Bartonella it spans from asymptomatic to very symptomatic and even fatal, but the asymptomatic infections far and away outnumber the symptomatic infections, which is hard for people to believe, but the studies have shown it for years and years and years. And in New England, the rates of asymptomatic Lyme, roughly around 10%, the rates of Miyamotoi, roughly 4%, and pretty much we should think on doubling that given what we know about the insensitivity of Lyme and Bartonella serologic assays, which implies around 30% of people are walking around with asymptomatic infection. In Bartonella, they looked at uh, healthy blood donors and 11% of adult healthy blood donors were seropositive for Bartonella, 25% of children with various diseases. The children with various diseases had primarily autoimmune diseases. So, I'd want to just uh, say that that's a clue. And the last slide is just about some data about Poland. Oops. So this study, I just hit my uh, computer. This study changed the way I looked at things. And it was a study by infectious doctor saying, are all diseases infectious? And the theme of my book, Chronic, is looking at the infectious causes of chronic illness. And there is data that, I'll just go down a few of them. This is by no means a comprehensive list. That there's data that Lyme can cause Sjogren's, which is considered an autoimmune disease characterized by dry eyes and dry mouth. There's data that Lyme can cause sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis is a granulomatous disease. The difference between a granulomatous disease and let's say abscesses is abscesses are kind of what fast growing, evolutionarily younger, easy to understand bacteria do. And granuloma are what slow growing fastidious organisms make. It's the reaction that the body you know, gets around them. And some granuloma like tuberculosis, you can isolate the TB. And some granuloma, you can't isolate anything. And when you can't isolate anything from some of these granuloma, they're saying that they're sterile granuloma and then they put them in the autoimmune category and sarcoid has been one of them. So, so Lyme can, has been implicated in potentially causing sarcoid. It's been documented to cause small fiber neuropathy and adult onset stills disease, which is an adult version of juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And Bartonella has also been implicated in sarcoid 
another condition called erythema nodosum, which is a nodular rash, and Wegner's, which is a serious inflammation of the blood vessels that can be life-threatening. It turns out that Wegner's is known to improve with the same antibiotics that have activity against Bartonella. And many antibiotics are shown to improve sarcoid. Many of the antibiotics that kill both Lyme and Bartonella work for sarcoid. So here we have cases of Bartonella causing adult onset stills disease, severe seronegative, seronegative arthropathy and spondyloarthropathy. Seronegative arthropathy means basically seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. Just to share another interesting tidbit. In 2010, I was sleeping in my bed. I got spider bites. And within two months of those spider bites, I had a rapidly progressive arthritis down my spine, which then spread out to my entire body. And within six months of those spider bites, I couldn't take a single step on my own. I went to 25 doctors, including three of the best rheumatologists in the Northeast. And my diagnoses were serum negative RA and spondylitis. They wanted to give me immune suppressants. Before those spider bites, I could run five miles, work all day and play tennis in the evenings and I wouldn't take them. And I rapidly progressed. I lost 50 pounds, got fevers 102 every night, became utterly bed bound, couldn't sit up on my own or turn over in bed, required 24 hour home care. Everyone thought I was gonna die. And to make a long story short, I pulled it together in the last minute and saved myself and got back to good health. And it haunts me, truly haunts me to think about the patients that get diagnosed with autoimmune conditions where nobody's ever looking at another perspective, that nobody ever asked the questions why. So Bartonella can cause not only the above, but also glomerulonephritis, which is a type of inflammatory kidney disease, vasculitic cerebral aneurysms, uveitis, which is an inflammation of the eye, and a type of autoimmune hemolytic anemia and inflammation of the thyroid gland. So although we have data that Bartonella and Lyme can mimic juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, if you notice the dates by which they said Lyme is mimicking it versus the dates where they say Bartonella is mimicking it or causing it, the Bartonella is newer. They didn't know about Bartonella in the 80s. You know, they only knew, they started learning about Bartonella when AIDS came along because Bartonella is an emerging infectious disease. Until HIV came along and the immune system started going south, they had no idea. They thought there were only two species of Bartonella. One was from the High Andes Mountains. If you didn't go there, you couldn't get it. And the other was uh, trench fever. The British in World War I getting trench fever in, you know, from, the, from the trenches there. So they actually haven't done antibiotic trials, not really for juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, but for adult rheumatoid arthritis, they've done plenty. And they're randomized controlled trials looking at antibiotics over placebo and not only do they work, and placebo doesn't work in multiple trials, they work when methotrexate and steroids are failing. And nobody talks about this. You never see it on commercials on television. And I have treated untold patients, untold numbers of patients with RA, with, with you know, getting their lives back, just like I got my life back. So, and then we talk about psychiatric illness because people a lot of times differentiate psychiatric from neurologic, and it's the same brain. So if the part of the brain that's involved that causes numbness and tingling is affected, or the part of the brain that's involved that causes anxiety and depression is infected, it's psychiatry is interesting to me. So it's the only field of medicine where they're dealing with the brain. They're not really so much studying the, the organic aspects of the brain. They're really, you know, there's a very big focus on the, um, on the uh, trauma kind of situations with the brain. But we see patients that have these illnesses develop psychiatric illness. And the studies show that there's a very uh, significant increase in psychiatric patient, patients testing positive for Lyme versus healthy controls. And that people with cat bites and scratches and other contacts with cats who are known risks for Bartonella acquisition also have higher rates of depression. And so schizophrenia, bipolar, Anxiety, depression, anorexia, and OCD has all been documented as part of, potentially as part of Lyme. And response of these psychiatric conditions has likewise been documented to resolve with antibiotic therapy. And even psychosis um, has been documented after well, you know, well documented Lyme and its resolution after antibiotic therapy. And the last uh, study is about a teenager diagnosed with schizophrenia institutionalized symptoms cannot be controlled with psychiatric medications. 
Bartonella antibody was negative, <clears throat> as it so frequently is. And if somebody were to just stop there, the investigation would have stopped. But the PCR was positive and the psychosis resolved with long-term antibiotics. And then I have a personal interest in this because I have a number of friends with MS. But so it's long been known that MS and Lyme can be clinically indistinguishable and radiographically indistinguishable, meaning that the MRIs, you can't tell the difference and the clinical symptoms, you can't tell the difference. They have found spirochetes in the pathology specimens of MS patients dating back over 100 years, literally. And they've done studies with animals where they've injected MS tissue into um, animals and shown that the animals developed MS. In the monkey studies, when they injected MS tissue into these monkeys, they found spirochetes in their spinal fluid. And somehow this wisdom has been forgotten and or buried. They've even found Bibidorphoria, they used to call them cystic forms, now they call them round bodies. It's a subtype of persister forms in the spinal fluid of all MS patients, but not from healthy people, except for one who had a history of Lyme. There are studies where authors have concluded that MS is likely caused by Bibidorphoria infection. And there's other studies showing that Lyme can trigger MS. I don't personally like the word trigger, like I don't like the word post-infectious, but there you have it. Here is statistical data from US Census stuff. They've looked at deaths from MS by county throughout the United States versus deaths from uh, Lyme, which is a, a proxy for um, arthropod induced deaths. And it's hard to tell on the, the Eastern and Western coast because there's so much of both. But if you look, let me see if my own cursor pops up. If you look at like the little discrete counties in the middle of the country where there's less here it overlaps and here it overlaps and there it overlaps and you have to and here it overlaps you have to wonder these are basically identical you know charts and sometimes a picture speaks a thousand words they have not done randomized control trials for antibiotics and ms I, I wish they would but in the open label trials they've shown some impressive pilot studies you know they had 10 patients on minocycline they demonstrated a high relapse rate before minocycline no relapses of minocycline between six and 24 months in high rates of MRI activity before minocycline and low rates of MRI activity after minocycline. Here they had patients who were breaking through despite beta seron, which is a standard MS treatment. Doxycycline was added for four months and it had reductions in contrast enhancing lesion numbers and post-treatment expanded disability status scale values. And then this slide is, it could be a little bit non sequitur, but it's not really this isn't just pertaining to Lyme or Bartonella. There's many infections that can lead people on the road toward dementia. It's another personal interest. So I always have to include it in my talks, but amyloid and alpha-synuclein and actually TMP43, but there's, these are all the um, aberrant proteins associated with neurodegenerative illness. So we'll just talk about amyloid and alpha-synuclein for a second. They've been demonstrated uh, that they're antimicrobial peptides. Like you say, why do the brains of people with why do we make amyloid? Why do we make alpha synucleins? So amyloid is the protein that's made with Alzheimer's. Alpha synucleins, what's seen with Parkinson's and Lewy body and the other Parkinson's plus syndromes. And it turns out that uh, mice that can't make these proteins with amyloid, they die quickly from a bacterial infection. And mice that can't make alpha synuclein die quickly from a viral infection. So it's actually protective uh, against early death. And there's studies demonstrating that spouses of dementia patients are at much higher risk, six times higher of developing dementia, and that neurosurgeons are 2.5 higher risk of dying from Alzheimer's. And, you know, uh, Rudy Tanzi was the top, um, you know, the top uh, reference over there. He's from Harvard, and he, they announced, whoops, they announced uh, their data early on that they really had this very good uh, model um, demonstrating that that uh, Alzheimer's uh, has a clear infectious link, and that's still considered uh, something that's in process. So that concludes my, my talk, and I just want to just uh, just end on the note that in, education is amazing and wonderful and great, but it tends to make us hyper focused, and we tend to lose sight of the forest for the trees. And it took me a long time for. To, to get a broader perspective on things because I, um, I was very, very hyper-focused coming out of residency and for the first 10 years of practice. And, and then I 
um, became less so and it was to my advantage, I think. So thank you very much for your attention.